today is Wednesday, July 8th, and COVID is still happening in Los Angeles. The medical ICU is full, surgical ICU is full. There is not a single ICU bed open in the hospital. It is Friday. Today is Saturday. Just another really hard day. Holy crap, he comes back to life. Heart starts beating, there's a real blood pressure. I'm like. An ICU nurse can only take care of one or two patients. We are busy here, we are drowning. You know, with California reopening and, and Los Angeles sort of getting back to regular life, but the outbreak, you know, being quite far from under control, we've sort of gone back to regular modes of functioning at the hospital plus COVID. I just sort of never really imagined that it would happen in that way. We're doing tons and tons of trauma. July is a very busy month for traumas. For example, I was on call yesterday and had a couple of gunshot patients come in who needed emergency surgery who happened to have COVID. So community spread is very common and very prevalent. There are tons of asymptomatic people coming to the hospital for other problems who happen to have COVID. So that's putting a strain on our system because we don't have the specific isolation beds that we might need for such a patient. I've been sort of surprised by that. That's just not what I pictured. The ER occasionally here will go on diversion except for the most critical of trauma cases. And then just the other night, we finished two cases in the middle of the night. One was a stab wound to the abdomen. One was a gunshot wound through the arm and through the belly. And this gunshot wound guy had COVID and the other guy uh, did not, but neither had an ICU bed available. So they had to just sort of park for the in the OR for like six hours while they waited for a spot. So. That's sort of what's going on these days. Um, still got my mask. Everybody's hanging in there. Good morning. It's Thursday, July 9th. It is 5.50 in the morning and I'm coming into work. COVID numbers going up. And if you look at the curve in Los Angeles, we had, just like in the rest of the United States, a big spike in April, which began to come down a little bit in May, which sort of flattened, but never really went away. And now numbers are going back up. So the curve in Los Angeles looks very similar to the curve in the rest of the United States with a big spike, a little bit of a flattening, and then up. It is still Thursday, July 9th. It is now 7.30 p.m. I am here on my little porch in my little rocking camping chair. And meanwhile, my phone is blowing up, trying to get me to move people out of the ICU because the ED is so full of ICU patients, they have nowhere to go. So they are trying to push current ICU patients out, 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 out as fast as possible. You know, when the system stretches, everybody suffers, not just COVID players. I have a bunch of COVID patients who are in the COVID unit, but have primarily trauma and surgical problems. And I was asked to move them out of the ICU. And I think it's too early because they still have ongoing issues and we're sort of grasping at straws as to which patients would be safest to move. Good morning, it is Friday, July 10th. I got a text last night letting me know that our hospital has reached capacity for the number of patients who require dialysis. So we have no more dialysis machines. As you guys probably have heard by now, um, COVID is not a respiratory illness. What it actually is, is a vascular illness. The virus attacks the tiniest little blood vessels in the body. You know, there happens to be some of those in the lungs, but there also happens to be a lot of those in the kidneys. So many patients, when they get very critically ill, go into kidney failure. It's gonna be a problem for our trauma patients. We've been advised to transfer early if we have patients who we think are gonna need dialysis, which is crazy. Like, where are we supposed to send them that, you know? Um, so we'll see. Happy Friday. One sort of interesting thing that has happened over the last couple weeks is patients who initially tested negative for COVID on the way in the door of the trauma bay uh, have become positive later in their hospital stay. As they're literally rolling in the door, somebody jabs a Q-tip in their nose and sends that off to the lab. We test every single patient who gets admitted to the hospital before they go out to rehab or something, the rehab place will ask for another confirmatory negative test and we'll send it and it will be positive. Some of those folks are asymptomatic, uh, but I have another patient who developed fevers, a cough, and a funny looking chest x-ray. 
we actually luckily are not bursting at the seams anymore in the ICU. We do have beds available, but we are still on diversion, meaning ambulances are still not bringing us patients except for trauma because we actually don't have enough respiratory therapists. In addition to needing physical space for patients, you need enough staff. An ICU nurse can only take care of one or two patients. A respiratory therapist, um, who's the person who runs the ventilators, uh, they can only have, I think it's five or six here. So our hospital's not full, but we still are not taking new patients uh, for that reason. Hey everyone, it is Monday, July 13th. It's 8 p.m. Um, just got home and showered. Um, just another really hard day. Um, we just had this young girl in her 30s just die of a massive, overwhelming um, soft tissue infection of the arm. Um, there was nothing we could do and it went from zero to 90 in like just a couple hours. She was impacted by the COVID um, outbreak because her family couldn't really be with her in her last moments um, and that's unfair and so much of this is unfair. One aspect that people probably have heard about in the press is the disproportionate effect that the COVID pandemic is having on patients of color. You know in Los Angeles County it's something like a third of the population is Hispanic but they represent 70% of all hospitalized patients. There's a lot of reasons, and some of them include the fact that most of those people are working um, frontline jobs where they can't work from home. And they are the people that are keeping the economy going, working in deliveries, working in the restaurants, working in the service industry. These folks are not able to self-isolate and protect themselves. In Los Angeles County, 2% of all inpatient admissions for COVID have been white people, which is obviously vastly underrepresented of how many white people there are in Los Angeles County. So um, that's unfair, right? And decisions and policies that open the economy too early are racist policies uh, because they will have a disproportionate effect on the health and life of people of color. Our government has just kind of wished this virus away and it's still here and we're opening. And actually today, Los Angeles and California, Governor Newsom said that we're taking a step back and opening. So I'm proud of that policy. People are at their wits end at the hospital. Um, so that's where we are today. Hey everyone, today is Tuesday. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. We had our quality improvement meeting today in which we go over our numbers for the trauma center, our volume, our outcomes, our mortality, that sort of thing. Our overall trauma numbers were much lower, but our overall penetrating numbers were much higher. Usually our percentage of penetrating trauma is somewhere around 20%, but for the months of April and May, it was significantly higher at more like 25%. It's you know hard to know if that's a blip in the statistics or if that's a real phenomenon that more people were shooting and stabbing each other despite the overall drop in trauma volumes. It's July 15th, Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. The news today is that the federal government has decided that the hospitals and local public health authorities should now be reporting their COVID data to a centralized database run by the White House and not to the CDC. This is concerning because of transparency issues and data sharing issues and accountability issues and privacy issues. I want to take care of patients and operate on sick people and do my job and do it well. We are busy here, we are drowning, we are stressed out. It is incredibly frustrating to be, part of my French, balls deep in taking care of a lot of sick patients and have the government types not be able to uh, deal with this effectively. I'm just like, guys, figure this out. Today is Thursday, July 16th, and there's been two situations in this last week that have been sort of like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. One is a lady who has um, a really terrible and difficult and complex abdominal wall hernia, and normally, between operations, we would be removing the breathing tube and putting it back in for just for surgery, but because she has COVID, 
and uh, reintubating and, re and extubating is just such a massive uh, exposure for the doctor who's intubating, the anesthesiologist who's intubating, the nurse and the respiratory therapist who would be extubating. This lady who otherwise would be awake and walkie-talkie just with this abdominal problem uh, has been intubated this entire time. And then another patient that's been sort of different because she has COVID is this um, lady that we admitted overnight. She's a young lady um, who was a uh, witness to be assaulted by three different people. She was getting kicked and punched and all these other things. She has this massive fever. So is that from an intestinal perforation that we don't know about? Or is that from her COVID? All of the things being equal, she probably would have earned herself an abdominal uh, operation to go in and check on things. But right now we're just chalking that fever up to COVID. So we'll have to see. She's sort of a mystery at the moment. So uh, we'll follow her closely and see sort of how she plays out. And we are being asked to recycle our N95s. PPE seems adequate here, but next to every COVID or negative pressure room, there is a bin to recycle the N95s. It's Friday, July 17th, 6.10 in the morning. I slept in a little bit. Um, I got a bunch of frantic text messages from the on-call trauma team last night because uh, there was not a single ICU bed in the entire house and they needed me to move somebody. And uh, we had to pick and choose. These are people who under normal circumstances would probably take another day or two of observation in the intensive care unit. But, you know, with uh, the crunch for beds, we had to sort of boot them out a day early. Um, so I think they'll be fine. Um, but it was just, it was a very surreal conversation that I was having last night, so. I just realized that on this day, two weeks from now, I will be walking out of the doors of this hospital for the last time. I will finish my year of critical care fellowship and that will complete 10 years of medical training and I'll be done. So two more days running in the ICU, then a few trauma calls in the last two weeks and I am out of here. Our center is also participating in a couple of clinical trials for COVID, which is pretty exciting. One trial that we're involved in is looking at mesenchymal stem cells, which are just stem cells naturally found in the body that have the potential to become anti-inflammatory type cells. Dr. Bowdish is coming around and keeping tabs on all the patients, collecting various data points and seeing whether it's helping. Good morning. It's Saturday, July 18th. I'm heading into the hospital for my last day ever rounding the ICU at County. Fellowship has 12 days left in it, so one more day rounding the unit and then uh, four 24-hour trauma calls in 11 days. I don't, that doesn't sound like that much, but that's a lot, but it's good. It'll be good. Um, it's a good, strong way to finish this year. Okay, well, it's Saturday, July 18th. I am finished rounding. Um, the overnight trauma team was very busy. We have uh, many new patients, many very sick new patients, and a lot of them have COVID. So just another day at the office. Because our hospital is cohorting the COVID patients and, and so strict about that, meaning the COVID patients can only go to certain units, a lot of our trauma patients are ending up in the medical ICU. These medical ICU nurses are now being asked to take care of trauma patients who have hemorrhaged you know, a ridiculous amount of blood volume or have bad head injuries. It's not sort of in their wheelhouse the way it's in the wheelhouse of the nurses up on five. You know, it just takes a little bit more communication. It takes a little bit more patience. It's for the greater good of the hospital and the staff and the patients that we sort of cohort all these COVID positive folks together. So we just have to kind of do what we have to do and adapt in that sense. It's July 20th, it's 9.20 p.m. A little bit past halfway done with this 24-hour trauma shift. I would say these last 12 days have been um, sort of less of a whirlwind than the first surge of COVID back in March and April. When LA was so shut down, all we could do was focus on taking care of COVID patients, and that's what we were doing. But now, since LA is open and we have this second surge, we are just doing a little bit of both at the same time. Operating on a COVID patient is like real slow. Everything that usually takes a long time takes 10 times longer. From anesthesia getting all set up with their very special space helmets to intubating safely and clearing out the room for 30 minutes with negative pressure. It's been so up and down and a roller coaster and nothing surprises me anymore. Like my life 
four weeks ago was really different from my life four weeks before that was really different from my life four weeks before that. So when there's new policies or new developments or new steps we have to take or new interesting twists on the way COVID and trauma can mix up, it's made me more dynamic and it's made our nurses more dynamic and our staff more dynamic. You just have to roll the punches because the punches are nonstop. It's been crazy, but we're used to it. We're used to crazy around here. It's what we do. We specialize in crazy. Oh my good lord. So now I'm finishing my 24 hour shift. Last night was like one of the craziest nights I've ever had here. One of these young kids, 28 years old, he was very unstable, very sick. Meanwhile, while that's going on, I get the trauma page that a gunshot wound's coming in. So run downstairs to see that. It's a lady who got shot through the arm into the right upper quadrant. Um, and it went sort of all the way across her abdomen and caused a bunch of trouble. And the pager goes off again. It's a stab wound uh, to the chest. So there's a two centimeter little lap laceration in the front of the heart. So I said, okay, so we put a little stitch in that and holy crap, he comes back to life. Heart starts beating, there's a real blood pressure. I'm like, Pah. Meanwhile, my other team is working on this gunshot wound who obviously also has COVID, uh, of course. Uh, my stab wound guy did not. Luckily, everybody was in there wearing their space suits and their special masks because we sort of, like I said before, we treat everybody when they're coming in like they do have COVID. And you know, thank God we do because 50% of our patients last night had COVID. So, yeah, I'm pretty jazzed right now, pretty amped up. Thank God everyone this morning is doing much better than they were last night. So, all in all, a very positive but very busy night. I have full faith in the staff that remains here to keep doing what they do, which is work really hard and care really deeply and take care of each other and take care of patients. We really should never forget a lot of people in the world have lost family members, their moms and their dads and their kids and their brothers and their sisters. That sort of puts everything to a little bit of perspective and a little bit of inconvenience here or there or a little bit of um, a need for ingenuity and adaptability. I think that's just a small price to pay. So I think that's it for me. I'm signing off. It's been great talking to you guys and sort of keeping this time as a little time capsule. All right, peace out. <laughs>